Thank you so much for joining us today. And if you participated on the first portion of this workshop last Friday, welcome back. If you didn't get an opportunity to um, join us last Friday, the workshop was recorded and it's available on our website. If you have trouble finding it, uh, feel free to email me or Ashley, we can direct you to it. Uh, last time we have about 80 people and speakers, so about 90 participants, uh, which we were pretty happy to see. Uh, let's see if we can break the record today. Today we have a very exciting agenda. I'll give you a quick recap about last week. Last week we focused more on the academic and the research side of things. Uh, we talked about uh, the trial side that we have at our vineyard in Wichita Creek uh, in Carneros. Uh, as I mentioned last time, anybody that is interested is welcome to come to our vineyard and see what we're doing with this um, trial. We had uh, over 300 sheep coming twice this year, and we are following very closely changes in soil health, and we're going to be looking at um, grape yield as well, and we're going to be looking at weed dis uh, displacement as the effect of having these sheep. So it's a very interesting study. We talk about all the details, so I encourage you to look at the video if you haven't done so already, and if you want to come and visit us, you are more than welcome to do so. Today, uh, we're going to focus more on a grower's perspective. Uh, we have a very interesting panel of growers that were kind enough to donate their time to us today to talk about their experience with sheep, what's working, what's not working. So I'm very, very excited. Uh, later today, we also have representatives from Fibership and CAF, the Community Alliance with Family Farmers and the Farmers Guild, to talk a little bit about what they're doing related to sheep. And some of you guys uh, might already have had some interactions with them, but we'll have them later today as well. So uh, a couple of housekeeping things, uh, like Ashley mentioned, we welcome questions uh, throughout the time that the speakers are presenting. So if you have a question, feel free to write it on, on the chat box and I'll keep track of them. And as the time allows, I will be addressing those questions. Um, let's try to keep it uh, for the questions related to whoever's speaking so that I can keep an organization of the questions as well. And then at the end, uh, we're gonna have time for uh, many, many more questions. So feel free to just keep dropping your questions as I am, um, as people are speaking, and then I'll be addressing them. And then at the end, uh, you can uh, you get to ask questions again. And if we don't get to um, address your questions, uh, feel free to email me or email Ashley and we'll get an answer for you. So, with all that in mind, um, let's let's have fun. Let's open up the conversations. Let's talk about the great benefits of sheep and the grapes. So with that, uh, please help me welcome Carrie Flores. Uh, she'll be our first speaker. She's the manager for Sinsky Vineyards and she has a long, long experience uh, with sheep and she's actually joining us from her backyard. So that's really refreshing. So Carrie, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, take it away. Hi, it's actually my front yard. Hi, <laughs> oh, your front yard, okay. <laughs> That's all right. Um, yeah, so I'm Carrie Flores. I've been the manager at Robert Sinsky Vineyards um, for the last two years. I started at Sinsky in 2008. And um, in 2006, I actually got my own sheep because I went to a, um, a seminar put on by Glenn McGordy up in Mendocino. Um, called Growing Greener Vines and Wines. And I saw these adorable sheep there and I just had to have them. And um, that started me on my whole adventure, um, raising sheep and breeding sheep. And, um, and now I um, actually manage the herd for Sinsky and we have um, a breeding program as well. So, I just wanted to talk about our adventures in grazing and the versatility of the amazing ovine and a little bit about having livestock guarding dogs um, as well. And so uh, the, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about Robert Sinsky Vineyards. We were established in 1988 by Dr. Robert Sinsky, who um, was an eye surgeon in LA. And he came up to Napa and started growing grapes and um, started working with Acacia Winery and became a partner. And then that was sold. And so he had all these grapes that I couldn't find a, 
a suitable um, buyer for. So he thought, well, I'll just make my own winery. So he started um, Sinsky Vineyards in 1988, and it's up on Silverado Trail. For those of you who don't know where it is, it's just um, slightly south of Yontville Crossroad. And his son, Rob, Rob Sinsky Jr., um, took over in 1991. And they noticed after about 10 years of farming conventionally, um, they were having some serious soil compaction issues. The water was running off. They were losing topsoil. And they had hired a, the youngest winemaker in Napa Valley. And he came up, he was working for Joseph Phelps. And Joseph Phelps was um, employing organic and biodynamic um, principles in their vineyard and so he talked Rob into doing it and Rob likes doing weird things and so they started their organic adventure um, and became certified organic in 2001 and they also started using biodynamic principles practices um, promoting bio biodiversity setting up owl boxes bat boxes um, bluebird boxes and raptor perches and incorporating sheep into the vineyards um, growing hedgerows, we have some pollinator habitats and bee yards, and then we added to that um, many diverse cropping systems. We have, of course, 160 acres of grapes. Um, we have a culinary garden and many fruit trees at various ranches. We um, grow olives and we make olive oil and cured olives and we actually have truffle trees and i haven't actually gotten any truffles yet but i'm hoping this year <laughs> to have truffles um, and then rob married a chef uh, maria sinsky and um, with all of that combined rob had a vision for guilt-free hedonism <laughs> where you could enjoy your wine and the good life and also take care of um, the earth so with that, oops, um, the, the sheep and the wool products are a part of our, our marketing story and um, also a feature in our wine club dinners. Uh, Maria's creations with lamb um, are very popular in our um, wine club dinners. So we, we do sell the products in our tasting room and Maria has made really cute um, little kits to we, uh, knit a beanie and then for more experienced knitters, uh, we have yarn and they make postcards and um, have a lot of features on the sheet in our, our tasting room. So our herd, I don't know why this, oh. our, our own little herd is a mixed breed. Um, they were developed by a fiber artist out of Petaluma. Um, so they're a Romney, Lincoln, Cordale, and a little Lester and Cormo mixed in. They were bred for crimp and Lester, and apparently the genetics are um, kind of cancel each other out. So um, the artist has, she's been kind of trying to find that right genetics to, to get crimp and luster. And they're a pretty large breed um, for, bred for um, meat and wool. We have a dedicated 10 acre pasture for them, hard fenced with um, a shelter. And our 2020 breeding herd, well actually they were bred in 2019, but produced in 2020. Um, we had 15 ewes and we got 26 new lambs, which you can see right there um, on the left. They had just gotten their tails docked. And so they're all kind of huddling in a mob going, what just happened? <laughs> and um, so then um, we keep two of our, we have two rams that we cycle through and we keep them at another ranch with um, electric, portable electric fencing. So- Sorry, Terry, sorry to bother you. Uh, you uh, said you had your PowerPoint, right? We are not able to see it. Oh, sorry. Yes, if you click the share button. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'll go back. It's all right. I thought I had shared. <sighs> yes, it can be weird sometimes. All right, we can see it now. Okay, Thank so I'll go back and um, 
So we, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, the winery, give you um, kind of our background and um, how we incorporate the sheep into our marketing story. And we have a chef as a, um, as a, a co-owner. So she does a lot of wonderful things with our, our um, sheep products. And then we sell the, the wool products in our, vin in our uh, tasting room. Um, and then our herd, like I was saying, is a mixed breed. And we, um, this is, this is our crop of lambs here. They just had their tails docked and, um, we keep two other, we keep two rams at another ranch. And then, um, we have our wool processed at Valley Oak Wool and Fiber Mill in Woodland. And then we have our lambs processed at Superior Farms in Dixon. They're pretty much the only place you can get your lambs processed anymore. Marin Sun in um, Petaluma closed down. And then we have, we send all the pelts to Bucks County Fur Products in Quakertown, Pennsylvania. So when you do have sheep that are for um, fiber, um, you have to get them sheared. And we're fortunate enough to have um, a guy that has been working with us since um, we first had our contract, Grazers Come. Um, he and his brother come from Williams, California. Um, he used to come as a, a shepherd with the, the contract grazer, but he's moved on to um, Cowell now. And, but he's still a really good um, sheep shearer. And um, we do all of our sheep pretty much in a day. And he does my little herd and he does, I think, Julie Johnson of Trace Sabores. So he has quite a little business here. And then I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, having sheep having your own herd. So if you are going to be doing breeding, um, it really requires annual vaccinations. And I'm able to get away with biannual worming and hoof, hoof trimming. <clears throat> if you're in an area with uh, heavier pest pressure, you probably have to do more worming. But because we move the sheep around a little bit and um, don't have very high worm pressure most years, um, I couldn't do it. Uh, twice a year, but there are people who move the sheep around and just do rotational grazing and don't worm at all. Um, so also, there are very few veterinarians that want to work with sheep. Um, they're mostly really busy with horses and cattle. And so um, you really have to become kind of a DIY sheep veterinarian. <laughs> and um, I've learned a lot about um, taking care of sheep in the last um, 14 years. And so I rarely have to have the vet come out, but they do um, help me um, in certain instances. And I'm able to get all my supplies from um, veterinarians who will work with me. Um, and then you have to consider that you will need supplemental feed when all of the natural forage dries up. Um, they still need food. And then if you're, getting, if you're going to get into lambing, um, that definitely requires extra vigilance. That's a, a very stressful time. And the lambs and the ewes need accommodations um, that, you know, you just can't, well, you can just pasture lamb, but it's, it's probably better if you have some kind of shelter for them um, to, to do that so you can keep an eye on them. Um, so as far as our seasonal grazing goes, we bring in a, a shepherd, I mean, we bring in a, a contract grazer who comes from Williams, California, and they've, he's developed a pretty unique system for us because most of our ranches are, um, they're kind of spread around Napa. They're not contiguous. So, um, I don't know if you saw last week's, um, presentation by Robert and Jamie Irwin, trucking expenses are probably some of the highest expenses for contract grazers moving the sheep around. So um, Willie Hoffman comes and he brings about um, 600 ewe lamb, ewes with their lambs, but we, we um, divide them up among our different ranches. So we have about 100 to 120 ewes with their lambs um, at our four different ranches and we graze about 30 to 50 acres per ranch. And so the total stocking rate is about three and a third sheep per acre. But 
he makes um, two or three rotations um, during the grazing season, which goes from about December to bud break, right before bud break. And so maybe um, the stocking rate, and then they, when he comes, they're put on much smaller um, sections of our vineyard. So maybe five acres at a time, they, they cordon off with a three wire electric fence. And so maybe our stocking rate is more like 20 and then we ro rotate around two or three times, so maybe it, it gets up to 60. Um, I, I'm not sure if that's how stocking math works, but um, it seems to work for us. Um, but a, a shepherd also comes with the herd, and he lives um, at my off. well, he lives, he parks a travel trailer at my office and um, takes care of the sheep every day, checks them, moves them around, makes sure they're, they're all safe, um, and does quite a bit of work um, during the day repairing fences. And then this is a little video. Robert and Jamie Irwin of, of Chaos Sheep Outfit um, came and brought, um, I think they said 500 sheep with their babies to um, our winery. We had a, a block that was damaged, destroyed really in the fire of 2017. And so we were redeveloping it and Rob wanted to bring sheep in to graze down the field before we replanted it and started redeveloping. So they did, they were in the area fortunately because it was already like June, I think, and so way past bud break. But they were still over on Yauntville Cross Road and so they, we talked about walking the sheep over but um, crossing Silverado Trail was gonna be a huge hassle. So they ended up just trucking them over and the people, the tourists at our, at the winery at the time really enjoyed seeing that display. Um, but they brought, I think they said 500 lambs. So we had a four and a half acre piece that we were, um, wanted to graze down. So it was like a stocking rate of over a hundred, a hundred per acre, but they were only there for maybe five days. So there are different ways you can do it. You know, the the really high stocking rate for a short period of time or a lower stocking rate, move them around. It just depends on the amount of labor that you want to spend um, because doing the lower rate requires rotating them around and it takes a shepherd. So it's a little more work. <clears throat> and then last week people were asking about salt um, and will sheep in the vineyard increase my um, sodium or salinity levels and so we went organic in 2001 and we had some seriously high salinity probably due to the fact that they had used um, chemical um, farming practices for the last um, 10 or 20 years and then we started putting the contract grazers in our vineyard in 2004. So since then, and this is you know 20 years worth of data, our salinity levels have um, fluctuated and now they're at their lowest levels they've ever been. And also our nitrogen has, has stayed at a pretty constant rate. Um, we do add compost and um, have the sheep in our in this block pretty much every year and this block is where the sheep come um, when they're for when they first arrive and then it's also where they're staged for when they leave so this block gets probably more sheep action than anywhere else any of our other um, parts of the ranch and um, as you can see it really hasn't affected um, the salinity too much maybe quite the opposite so then I wanted to talk a little bit about livestock guarding dogs. And you can see the pelts here that we um, have gotten back from Bucks County Fur Products. And this is my um, little pelt with a face. 
um, she uh, is a Great Pyrenees. And there are a lot of different livestock guarding dogs, but Great Pyrenees um, kind of evolved with, with sheep and they're one of the most popular dogs for their, their disposition. And um, they were thought to um, originally descend from um, Central Asian or Asia Minor um, herding dogs around 5,000 years ago. So they are really an ancient breed and they kind of evolved with, with um, nomadic peoples and guarding the flocks. So they kind of look like sheep <laughs> and to, um, to a wolf or a coyote, um, having a dog there is kind of a deterrent for them approaching the herd because who knows if that dog is gonna get up and you know fangs and claws flying at them. So it's kind of a deterrent and it's good that they kind of look like sheep. Um, the Great Pyrenees was named the Royal Dog of France by Louis XIV or Louis uh, the 14th. And I don't think they've really forgotten this. Um, they think they're pretty special too. And then they came to um, North America, well, Canada really, the area of Canada, and were bred with the native Newfoundlands and they created the Landseer, they're part of the Landseer Newfies. And then they came to the US with a French general Lafayette in 1824. So you can see they've been around for a pretty long time. And um, during the world wars, um, the breeding kind of um, had a terrible effect on them. And to restart the couvage, um, they were bred with Great Pyrenees. And so there's a lot of different genetics that you'll find in Great Pyrenees. Like one of mine has a curlier coat, which is a um, more of a couvage uh, characteristic. But the thing that you can really tell Great Pyrenees is that they have the double dew claw on their hind feet, which is a breed standard. So please don't ever remove them. And they have this mega dense coat, um, a double, uh, coat and they are huge shedders. So they need to be groomed a lot. And they differ from border collies in that they, they're, not, they're not herding dogs. They pretty much stay with the sheep and they guard them at night. And they're pretty low energy dogs all around, except at night. <laughs> um, so here's some typical um, a Great Pyrenees and that just looks like a Landseer maybe mixed with some Newfie and yeah I would not mess with that cat but that's not a typical um, livestock guarding animal but it does look like a serious cat um, and so they're really smart and they were supposed to be independent and act on their own and patrol thousands of acres with um, with no supervision. And so they are very, very intelligent and that can make training them a bit difficult sometimes. But people do um, have, have used them or <laughs> train them in agility trials and they can be motivated with food, but um, they, they need the right motivation. So they do require a bit of training and good fencing is absolutely mandatory and they will find the holes in your fence. I have my one dog who's the, um, <laughs> the pelt with a face. She roams around my neighborhood. Well, a very wide territory out here in um, Carneros. And I've met more people because of my dog than I ever would have on my own. Um, so if, you, if you're thinking about a livestock guarding dog, you have to have really good fencing. And then um, they are primarily nocturnal, so they bark a lot at night. And so if you have neighbors, you might want to take that into consideration um, because they are typically um, more vigilant and more active at night and less active during the day. But you can train them to become diurnal. Um, my pelt with a face has learned how to be a, um, a daytime dog but I, my other two still um, patrol at night and bark. But fortunately, I live kind of in a um, less populated area and everybody around here has dogs. So everybody barks when there's a coyote. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about rescue. Um, 
a lot of, of these dogs are abandoned when there's an economic downturn. And I um, bought this dog, the, the one in the middle here, um, from in 2008, when um, we had a terrible, I guess, great recession. And these people lost their goat farm over in the Pittsburgh, Antioch region area um, of the East Bay. And um, she was my first livestock guarding dog, really good dog. And this little guy was abandoned at a feed store in El Dorado County. And I got involved with Great Pyrenees Rescue and um, I was supposed to foster him for two weeks. <laughs> and I ended up keeping him and he became a really, this is him here, and he became a really good um, livestock guarding dog. Bonnie, this dog, she taught him really well. And this was the first night he um, ever did solo guarding duty because he had been with Bonnie before, but it was a really rainy night and Bonnie didn't feel like going out. <laughs> so he did it all by himself and he was a very good boy. And <laughs> this is um, nine and she was the ninth dog we got in rescue one month and we were tired of coming up with unique N names because it was an N um, month and we just named her nine, but she was found running loose on the streets of Red Bluff. And she, I think she probably escaped from a, a sheep operation up there, but she just not, wouldn't stay with the herd. So there are um, dogs that are more, um, have more of an aptitude, but um, because they are just abandoned, um, a lot of times, many of them are good dogs and need new farms to guard. So if you are thinking about getting a livestock guarding dog for your, um, for your herd, then I would strongly urge you to rescue before purchasing a dog. And there are a lot of um, rescue groups um, around, so, and a lot of resources for finding them. So that is pretty much all I wanted to say. And um, thank you. And I guess if you have any questions, there'll be time for that later on. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Carrie. It's uh, very interesting to see, uh, we forget about the important role of the dogs in, in, in this operation. And especially for you guys that have your own herd, um, when Chaos brings their sheep, they bring their own dogs as well, right? When who brings their sheep? When Chaos. Um, yeah, and, and um, in another video, um, you can see their dog exiting the trailer with the sheep. It was, they had s several layers of um, several floors on that trailer and the dog I think was like on the third floor and um, exited with those sheep too and just kind of followed along and stayed with the sheep on our hillside there. Yeah, I've had the opportunity to see their dogs and uh, it's really interesting to see them in action. Really, really interesting. Um, so Carrie, uh, you, you guys have your herd. Uh, remind me how many sheep you guys have of your own? Mm, let's see. So I have, um, I have 26 new baby lambs and then I have um, about 32 in my herd altogether between the rams and the ewes. That's not enough for you to actually graze your vineyards, right? You Absolutely have not, no. Yeah, exactly. um, we, that's why we bring in the contract grazer because, you know, mm -hmm. we found out that that's seriously, when they first started doing the sheep, you know, that's definitely not enough stocking rate to um, graze um, the acreage that they have. Okay, so you, you're you sort of like an example of kind of like in the middle. We were talking last Friday about people that don't want to have their own sheep and what they can do to hire a company. Mm -hmm. Now about the possibility if you want to have your own, you're kind of in the middle. You have enough that I think, uh, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you have enough so that uh, you can showcase to your customers the beauty of having a livestock and having the fiber and like you said, just having... Uh, doing the meat production in a conscious way, but also showing the benefits to your own vineyard. Uh, any thoughts at all uh, that Sinsky has had on actually getting a bigger herd or you guys are pretty happy as it is? 
Well, I think we're, we're pretty happy as it is because we don't have, we don't really have the land to dedicate to more sheep. I mean, if we had a bigger herd, we would need more land and they don't want to rip out any vineyards yet. Maybe after this year we will, but um, we don't have any more place to keep more sheep. You know, that's, that's consideration is, mm -hmm. is the land and the stocking rate. So, okay. Definitely yeah. something to consider for everybody else. Uh, if you're thinking about having a herd, uh, you can always start small, uh, like Sinsky is doing. And I think uh, it's, it's nice to have Carrie here so that we can ask those kind of questions. But if anybody's thinking like, you know what, it might be too much work. Um, maybe you can have a couple and then try it and, and see how it goes from you. Uh, we do have one question from the audience. Uh, somebody's wondering if the natural forage is nutritious enough for your sheep or you have to supplement? Yeah, we do have to supplement. And especially if you're breeding, you wanna make sure that the, the sheep have enough nutrition to make uh, milk for the, um, for the lambs. So we, we do supplement. Okay. Do you think that the cost um, of bringing sheep or owning sheep is, um, is sufficient to offset the cost of what would it be mowing? Um, it's debatable, <laughs> but, um, they're able to get into the field a lot earlier than I am with, with mowers. And I think we get about two, um, two, mo we save about two mowing passes with the sheep. Um, but it's, it's mostly, you know, kind of a, a marketing, um, aspect for the winery something different, something more organic than, you know, spraying herbicide, which is what we're trying to avoid. Okay, that's a good point to make, um, especially for those that are, uh, that have a, an organic certification where you are limited on the amount and type of herbicides that you can use. This could be an alternative. You don't have to own your own sheep, but if you decide you want to give it a try, you can always go with uh, one of the companies out there um, have you worked, you've worked with other companies, right, Carrie? Not only Chaos, you worked with someone else before. If I yeah, well, we still work with Willie Hoffman and he, um, you know, it's kind of dicey in some years we don't get to bring them in because there's not enough forage and um, he has to, he has to break even or, you know, make a profit. And if he can't get here before, I think, I think he said, um, by February 1st is his cutoff date, he won't come. So he constantly monitors the situation. And a lot of times he's able to bring them in in December, but sometimes they don't come till like the end of January or early February. And then he gets maybe six weeks of grazing time in. Okay, that is, uh, that is definitely interesting. We have another question. I don't know if you can answer these, Terry, uh, or we can leave it out for our later speakers. Uh, so you mentioned how many sheep need to graze per acre uh, of vineyard, right? I think you said 3.33. Right, but that, that's just our way of doing uh -huh. it because we rotate them around. Well, because we rotate them around. Uh -huh. um, we bring in about 100 to 120 sheep per ranch, and our ranches range from 30 to 50 acres. And uh -huh. so that's a stocking rate of about total stocking rate of about 3.3 but because we rotate them around maybe two or three times it, it brings our stocking rate up a little bit more um, by the way we do it but the way that maybe chaos sheep and they could talk about this a little bit more they bring in a lot more sheep at, at one time and then they are there for a, a much shorter amount of time. And so it just depends on, on what you want. If you, if you need the, sh the sheep, if you have time to have them there for an extended period of time, you could have a lower um, stocking rate, but if you need to get it done fast, you wanna bring a lot of sheep all at once. So yeah. it, 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 it varies with what you wanna do. Yeah, that's something that I would recommend whoever asked the question, try to reach out to these companies and see what they will do. Uh, they're trying to get in and out as fast as possible and you are more 
uh, propense to some damage that way. But if you want to get them in and out, like we had a, an issue last year where we were very close to bad break. So we got them in and out in a matter of three days just to make sure that we would uh, prevent any damage to the buds. Mm -hmm. um, but every operation is going to be different depending on what cover crop you have already established. It might be different uh, also. So I encourage you to look out um, to those companies that bring the sheep and then you can have a better conversation with them about that. Uh, same person asked about grazing sheep in citrus and avocados. Uh, have you had experience with any other crops other than grapes, Carrie? Well, I took my sheep up to um, Frogs, was it Frogs Leap? And they grazed in the, the fruit orchard up there. And they actually started, because they ran out of forage kind of quickly, they started gnawing on the um, the bases of the olive trees and I had to get them out pretty quickly but I bought one of my rams from a kiwi grower up in um, it was Chico somewhere up there somewhere up north and um, so I think you can put them you know anywhere that there's forage um, under avocado trees, I, I'm not sure how much forage there would be or citrus trees. If you are organic, I, I would think that it, you could do it, but you just have to, to watch out and make sure they have enough to eat or they will start gnawing your, your trunks. And I think sheep can be trained as well, up to some extent. Um, well, yeah, there was that, that lithium um, aversion training that we tried to do. Um, it it works for a very short time and then the genius sheep if one sheep tries it they kind of notice and oh that he didn't <laughs> die so i'm gonna try it and they learn pretty quickly that um if something's tasty they're gonna eat it so that aversion training didn't work too well i mean it worked at first and then they got over it <laughs> yeah i apologize for anybody that is joining us from outside the grape industry um, sadly, here in Napa, we are very grape centric. I have worked with other crops, but not with the sheep. Um, so if you're interested, email me separately and maybe we can figure out uh, somebody else that has had that experience. I imagine they'll be fine. Um, there, there's, there might be some concerns with the produce regulation. I know if you're doing vegetables, that's a whole different ball game than if you're doing orchards or grapes. So I yes. reach out to uh, your ag commissioner if you are outside of Napa, uh, and if you're here, feel free to email me and maybe we can talk more about it. Um, okay, we have a couple more questions here. Uh, somebody's asking if you train your own dogs. <laughs> yeah, I do, um, but you you have to um, ha have them from an early age, I think, with with the sheep. And it helps if they have a mentor. Um, and like I said, some of them have an aptitude for it and they like it and they like being with the sheep and some of them just don't. But um, yeah, I've, I've only trained my own dogs. How many hours do you think it requires of training more or less? Mm, it, it takes quite a bit. I mean, they need to be with the herd, you know, at least eight hours a day so that they get used to um, uh, being around the sheep, not chasing them, stuff like that. Uh, somebody's asking here, how do the guardian dogs interact with the herding dogs? Yeah. Like the they, dogs? they have a good time. My sister has a border collie and she, um, she loves coming up and, and playing with my dogs and they uh, enjoy her. She's got a lot more energy than my dogs though. So they get they just get a little tired. They play with her at first and then they're just like, oh, you're wearing me out. So they, um, they can interact. Okay, interesting. Um, somebody's asking if um, you alter your cover crop to integrate any medicinal or protein elements for the herd. Well, uh, we have used some hot mustard and mustard grows naturally all around. So that supposedly is a natural wormer for the sheep. I don't really know if it, it has or hasn't helped. And then as far as protein, um, alfalfa <laughs> um, would be the protein that you would plant, but alfalfa is a host for the, al the three-cornered alfalfa hopper, which is a vector for red blotch. So um, no, we can't incorporate or don't want to incorporate alfalfa 
in our cover crops or um, adjacent to our, our fields for the sheep because it's a, a vector of... It of, seems like you have to be a little bit of a dance there. What is good for the vineyard? And luckily you can always supplement the sheep's diet. So it's, yeah. I don't think it's the end of the world. Um, somebody's asking us about carbon levels in the soil. I can tell you that that is something that we are looking at as part of the study that we're doing in our vineyard in Carneros, which is a Creek vineyard. Um, we will be collecting soil samples next year. So if you're interested in looking at the carbon level in the soil, uh, feel free to send me an email later next year. We'll try to make it kind of like an announcement. Um, and the best way to know exactly what we're doing as the RCD is to join our newsletter. That's how you're going to know exactly all of our projects. You're going to know about our upcoming workshops. So I really recommend that you join our newsletter by going on our website. Uh, so about the carbon soil levels, uh, there will be more to come on that. Um, one last question um, for you, Carrie. Somebody's um, wondering, so you said, uh, or this person believes you said that you graze from December to bud break. And they're saying, do you have grapes on the vine that late? If not, why don't you bring them earlier? Yeah, it's just when there's enough forage and the shepherd comes up and, and no, we don't have grapes at that time, but because there's not enough forage for um, the herd, because they're a pretty big herd and they're with their lambs and they need a lot of, of feed to convert to milk for their babies. So there's just not enough um, forage for the, the ewes to eat. They'll deplete it really fast and then he has to move them off site and it is very expensive to transport sheep around. So we have to have enough forage mm -hmm. at the beginning and enough um, rain so that the forage grows back because he does rotate them around um, to, to bring the sheep. I mean, otherwise, um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to have them, you know, as soon as the, um, the grapes are off the vine, but it's really dry at that time of year. And I know that there are people who are redesigning their trellis system to um, accommodate sheep year round, but we haven't, that's, you know, not something that we can do right now. Okay. Awesome. Um, thank you so much, Gary. We really appreciate it. Uh, if you uh, get the chance, please stick around and hopefully uh, we can circle back to any questions, but this is all the one, uh, questions that people have wondered. Um, another important thing, I see that some people are starting to chat about their experience with uh, sheep in orchards. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, if we have time, I'll go back and read some of your comments, but if you're interested in see what Ruth and Henry are mentioning about their experience with uh, sheep in orchards, I encourage you to read uh, the chat box. All right, Carrie, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to move on, on to our next uh, two speakers. Uh, we're very happy to have uh, Dave Cobol from Noble Vineyard Management and Jake Noblock from Summer Store Vineyards. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Jake and Dave. Uh, they do not have a PowerPoint presentation. What we're going to do is we're just going to go ahead and get started on asking questions. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started with Dave. If you could just briefly tell us, Dave, your experience with sheep, how long have you been using them, in which scenarios you use them, and what's your opinion about integrating them in the vineyard? Sure. Um, well, I got started with sheep back in the early 2000s, uh, working with Bonterra up in, in Mendocino County. And we ended up grazing sheep on probably around 800 acres total. Uh, we worked with Chaos. Uh, we had another operation that we worked with for a couple years before that. Um, and then we switched to Chaos. And it was, I don't know, we had a great experience working with them. Um, you know, biggest things was our vineyards were not designed for sheep. So there was plenty of, plenty of irrigation repairs and whatnot to do. Um, and then here at Noble Vineyard Management, we've, um, uh, I think we were a couple hundred acres that we did this year at the most um, in various places, you know, and with, at Bonterra, it was nice because they were all pretty close and we could just walk sheep around. Um, but now having these vineyards all over the place, we have to do a little bit more movement. Um, you know, and Robert gets very creative with how he moves the sheep around. There's a lot of walking sheep up the road. It's like uh, back in the old days and you get stuck on Old River Road with sheep going by you. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, that's about it in a nutshell, to be brief. Okay, thank you. That's great. Uh, Jake, uh, similar question. Uh, just tell us your experience with Qi. When did you start working with them? Uh, in which scenarios you use them? And what's your opinion in general about integrating them in the vineyard or your operation? Yeah, so uh, I'm at Summerston Estate at Highway 128 up by Lake Berryessa. Um, it's a 1,700-acre ranch with 250 acres of vineyard. Um, so we have a lot of uh, wild vegetation, grasslands, hillsides that are unmanaged. Um, we introduced the sheep probably in 2008 or 2009 as really a wildlife manage or a grassland management tool to really prevent wildfire hazards. Um, We've not included them in the vineyards very often because a lot of our blocks are high density plantings, five by four, six by four. And to David's point, it, um, it's difficult to design a trellis system that accommodates the sheep um, at that density. So uh, we typically use them in the hills around the vineyard blocks and then in areas that kind of buffer the blocks to like a deer fence row or something like that. So um, that's what we primarily use them for. Um, we don't measure really the soil health, but we've seen an increase and in, or a, um, an improvement in erosion and rodent control. Um, we have a really healthy hawk and eagle population out here now because of all the uh, management or um, grassland management we do keeps the grass low and allows the birds to do what they do best. Um, you know, we, as far as breeds, we, we started with Dorper and now we kind of are leaning or, or wanting to do more Suffolk. Um, we, we keep about 500 sheep on the ranch all the time. Um, that ranges a little bit from year to year, but usually 400 to 500 is a pretty good number for us. And it takes me about 250 days to get across the ranch. And I have been at Summer Sun. They do have a lot of open space, uh, just like many of you may have, um, so this is an interesting perspective as well, not using them necessarily in the vineyard, but in the perimeter. So that, that's an interesting perspective, Jake. Um, Dave, back to you. Um, could you tell us what, in your opinion, is uh, the best, uh, the greatest benefit of incorporating sheep and also what is the greatest challenge, um, if you haven't mentioned it already? Um, <clears throat> well, I think the greatest benefit is that they, in an organic system. Um, they do a better cleanup job than anybody could do with combination of mechanical cultivation under vine and weed ears and all that sort of thing. They clean everything and they, they clean it to you know about 30 inches high. Um, so they do a really nice job. I mean, when you get done with sheep through a vineyard, it looks like a golf course. It really is amazing. Um, we've had, you know, and as well as, you know, like inorganic weed management, if you have Bermuda grass problems, you get a lot of old material built up around the, the vines, um, the sheep will come in and they kind of clean it up. They don't necessarily eat it all, but they'll stomp it in and they'll knock it down. Um, so you get, you know, just a little bit cleaner look at the end of the day as for your vineyard. Um, and then like Jake says, doing around the perimeter fences and things like that. It's just fantastic. I mean, the sheep are there, so you just say, hey, you know, your contract grazer, could you just put the fence over here and clean up this area? Um, and so you can get a lot of extra cleanup done um, around the property. Um, I think, you know, in terms of the, with sheep, you just have to think a little bit more and think outside the box. Um, you know, I had them graze in my own vineyard this year and you know, I thought I had everything tied up around my irrigation filter, you know, the hoses and the wires and whatnot. And they chewed on my control box wires and they can, they chewed on the hoses for the pressure regulator. So, you know, all those things had to be fixed. Um, 
So it's just with that experience, you know, and sometimes experience is the only way you learn because you don't think of the things that a sheep are going to do. Um, you end up kind of armoring your property um, for sheep grazing. And then down the road, it becomes cheaper and easier and, and less of a hassle in that regard. Um, the, the biggest thing, you know, is then in terms of concerns, I think, are, are neighborhood dogs and, you know, random people walking by doing random things. You know, kids thinking it's fun to scare sheep and ski, sheep will blow right through an electric fence. You know, if they're running from something, the electric fence is not going to stop them. Um, so you need to think about those things as well and controlling in that and managing that in some way, either by putting up signs or closing your gates to your property or, or however. Um, but it's kind of those unexpected things that can really, really be a hassle and can really cause a lot of damage in, to the herd and to neighboring properties as well. So with that in mind, Dave, so you have always hired a company from what I understand, right? You don't own or yeah. have owned your own sheep? Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. So what would you, uh, just a piece of advice for anybody that wants to bring the sheep uh, as far as preparation or adjustments, because you're only going to have the sheep for a specific amount of time. So you don't have to make mm -hmm. uh, life changing modifications, but any piece of advice on what to expect, what, what you should be trying to prevent? Um, first thing is talk with your contractor. You know, whoever that is, I mean, I've, I've only worked with Robert and Jamie for the last, you know, 15 plus years. Um, so we have a kind of a mind meld going there. But if you're new to it, talk to your contractor and ask them first and foremost, and then ask them who they've worked with. And if you could call them, call those people and just say, hey, what, you know, what happened on your property? What are you worried about? What do you, how do you prepare? and get that kind of on the ground kind of information. Because if your vineyard, like my personal vineyard, I, I designed for sheep. And so my drip hose is at 30 inches and all my risers are tied to things. You know, obviously now I've learned about my filter. Um, I don't have hardly any problems with the sheep as long as I have it, all my drip hose, you know, tied to the wire and up high enough. You know, if there's anything loose, the sheep will find it and make a mess out of it. Um, but getting that information from the, your neighbors that have used the company um, that have similar systems to you, you know, if you're up in Oregon, maybe there's a whole nother different um, series of things that you need to think about that I would just never have any experience with. So I think local knowledge is the best. Okay, that, that sounds really good. Um, and I can tell you, um, we started using our sheep as part of the study in Carneros two years ago, and I did no preparation whatsoever. I led all for the, the company to come over and bring the sheep and do their thing. They brought the fencing, they brought everything. And I did see a little bit of damage on the lines here and there, but nothing too concerning. So in the two years that we've had them, in my experience, we haven't had issues, but uh, every vineyard will be different. Uh, Jake, on, on your experience, what would you consider to be the greatest benefit of incorporating sheep in your operation? You do have your own herd, so what would you consider the greatest challenge? Yeah, I mean, I like uh, like any agricultural business, uh, you're kind of subject to Mother Nature and some of uh, her challenges. But, you know, we started it as kind of fire management and, and grassland management tool, but we've um, found some added benefit along the way. I mean, obviously, you develop some relationships with these herds, but um, it's become, like Carrie said, you know, it's marketing. Um, we do uh, at the estate where I work um, up here, we do buggy tours. So we um, take visitors around in Polaris Rangers and we visit blocks that are specific to maybe what they're tasting for the day. And then we'll go see the herd. And, um, you know, there's um, offerings for wine club members with boxed uh, you know we also use superior farms and dixon they're great to work with um, we are limited on on who who we can work with uh, around here just by um, you know logistical location um, but yeah you know it's really just added some fun you know things to the ranch um, we, you know, at lambing time, it's exciting to go out and, and see all the babies. And when we're moving sheep, it's an all 
hands on deck affair. You know, it's, it's not something that um, just Aldo the shepherd can do on his own. Um, we have three great Pyrenees and three border collies um, without all six of them, uh, Aldo, you know, would, would really be at a loss. So uh, these dogs are incredible. Um, they help. It, it's pretty fun to watch if you've never gotten to see it. Um, but along with all that fun stuff or a lot of, you know, blood, sweat and tears, um, you know, lambing can be difficult. There's um, problems with that process. Um, you know, depending on the season, we, you know, get sheep that are sick. Um, you know, we got to give them medicine to make their sniffles go away. You know, deworming, you know, sometimes twice a year, sometimes once. Um, with your own herd, I mean, we castrate, we dock tails, we do all of our vaccinations, all of our deworming, um, all of our shearing. Um, it's, it's, it's a busy job. Um, when I came up to Summerston, I was hired to manage vineyards and um, I've adopted sheep and the landscape and maintenance of the winery as well. So the sheep take up a big chunk of my time. Um, you know, the dogs, um, unfortunately, they, there's sometimes some costs um, associated with the dogs. Um, a couple of my great Pyrenees are really good at sticking to the herd and then I've got to wander and um, I've lost a couple dogs um, that have chased after maybe coyotes or mountain lions and they've gotten hurt uh, or stuck in fences or in brush or vegetation so there's some sad stuff that happens there but um, you know it's it's not a cheap venture if you're gonna you know, I, I, I love looking at the cost breaker for some of the vineyard studies of bringing sheep in. And I can relate to those travel costs because it's difficult to move these things around in a truck. Um, I'm lucky I get to move them from one side of the ranch to the other. But there is, um, yeah, there's just in corral work. I haven't really mentioned anything about that, but we've got like 10 permanent corrals on the ranch. And there's always work in those, you know, you're doing fence work, you're making sure, you know, we don't have water all around the ranch. So I move a water truck with the sheep and trays and troughs and food. And um, we grow our own hay on site, which is great, but there's a whole nother operation that um, can be challenging in itself. Um, you know, last year's hay crop was ruined because a couple of days after we cut it and laid it down, we got a few inches of rain, um, you know, ruined about 50 acres of hay. So um, lots of challenges with it. I, I just caution anybody who uh, wants to go out and buy 500 sheep and, uh, and run with it. it. It's a, it's an adventure. Great. Um, I think that, I don't know if we can all agree, but at least uh, we can all speculate that the incorporating sheep into the vineyard does have a marketing benefit to it. Otherwise, Somerston, otherwise Dave, Carrie wouldn't be doing it. Um, I think there's a lot of work to be done to figure out the logistics and to figure out the actual uh, economic benefit of having the sheep. But Jake, uh, for you, uh, economically speaking, as far as fire prevention, does it make sense for you to have the sheep versus paying a company to just come and take care of your um, take care of your of your fire prevention problems yeah you know I mean it's something something we've um, discussed a lot um, before um, we brought the sheep in or before we had a herd of our size we started with a smaller herd and needed some help and uh, we brought in about I don't remember the quantity exactly, but it was close to 2,500 sheep. And it took them about two months to get across the whole ranch. And at that point, we just realized we weren't set up infrastructure wise. So, you know, the next few years as we grew our head or herd, um, we started to get the right equipment in place and, and, and um, you know, get prepared to do it on our own. But um, 
Miguel, that's something we look at a lot because I mean, the shepherd, you know, there's a salary associated with that. There's a few months a year that we need to provide feed, you know, and, and last year there wasn't great feed available. So we bought marginal alfalfa, marginal oat hay, um, and paid big dollars for it. And really it wasn't great nutritional value. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I sometimes am jealous of the people that bring them in for a short period of time and, and don't have to kind of wrestle with all the challenges of owning your own herd. Well, that's, that's Dave. So Dave, yep. um, in your opinion, do you think that what the sheep do just for your soil is enough to offset the cost? Or do you think that the marketing benefits, the, uh, anything else that comes with it, of actually make it worth your time if it would be just for the soil would you still do it um in an organic situation absolutely uh, especially if, if i was paying a management company to do uh, undervine weed control i mean really if you look at the sheep the cost to bring sheep in for a couple of passes throughout the winter if that saves you two passes undervine you probably you know um come out as a push or even come out a little ahead, depending on what the charges is, are for a tractor and equipment and employee. Um, so from a financial standpoint, if you're not doing the undervine yourself yet, I think it's definitely economically feasible. Um, if you're in a mixed, um, you know, conventional system where you're using herbicides or you're being sustainable, um, again, I think from a marketing standpoint, going to a winery that you're trying to sell to you know, any little thing that makes you stand out, especially in this market, is a bonus. Um, and it's just something, you know, that, you know, makes that winery think that you're doing something a little bit more, that you're going to care a little bit more. You're thinking about your soil as well as, you know, your fruit. You know, that should all come in a bundle. Um, in terms of, you know, what the sheep provide to the soil, um, for me, I think it's worth it. Um, I think, you know, you're looking at diversity is better whether it's with the vines, the insects up on top, or whether it's in the soil down below. And if you've got sheep coming in, you know, urinating, defecating out there, you're bringing in different microbial populations, which create a more diverse soil ecosystem. Um, so you get that better, it's a better digestive system working in the soil, having all those different microbes there. Um, so I think, it's, I think it's a positive. There's just no doubt. I think one of the things that you do have to manage though is compaction. So if you're on a clay soil versus a sandy loam soil, you're gonna have different issues and you're gonna to have to work around that timing so that you can create problems uh, if you don't manage the herd and manage where they are at different times, you know, whether there's rainfall or not. Uh, that's one thing that I've definitely seen in managing, you know, where you, where you feed and water them. You know, if they come back to the same place every day for feed and water, make sure it's out of the vineyard because uh, that place will get compacted for sure. Yeah, definitely. That's one of the things that we were concerning our study. I did go out there myself and measure compaction after uh, every grazing event, and we were lucky enough that we did not see major compaction. I mean, you can argue if you don't bring your sheep, you have to mow. So you have to mm -hmm. tractor. And just like when you mow or you till, you have to keep an eye on your moisture content in the soil. If the conditions are not right, you don't bring the tractor. Similarly, if the conditions are not right, you don't bring your sheep. Um, so there's, there's definitely a dance to do there. And like we mentioned during our first workshop last Friday, there's a lot of science that is being done to actually understand the specific benefits to soil health. I can tell you as a soil scientist that uh, there's enough science out there that I feel confident enough, and that's why we decided to do this workshop, that we feel confident enough that there's major benefits to your soil the reality is that there's still a lot of science being done and it can be case by case depending on when you start and how intense you do it and the modifications that you make. Um, Dave, uh, have you seen, I mean, I know you're convinced about the benefits of sheep. I know you've been using it for a long time and I know that you will continue using them, but have you seen any just visual benefits? Uh, have you seen any improvements on your grape quality, any improvements just on your general operation? Um, in terms of grape quality, I don't, 
think so. I mean, there's, it's just, there's so much year to year variation. Um, and my, my palate certainly isn't good enough to see that. Um, I think in terms of what's happening out in the vineyard, a lot of my, you know, weeds that I have difficulty controlling that get up high in the canopy or like want to come up and be fibrous if I have the sheep in there, those problems are eliminated. Um, you know, you, you, it seems like I've seen more of a shift um, to just less noxious weeds in the vineyards for what the populations that we have up here. Um, so it seems weed control is getting easier and not more difficult for me. Great. For you, Jake, um, I, I'm going to have to put you on the spot a little bit, buddy. If you're willing to be a little bit honest with us, uh, we are among friends here. In your opinion, um, what is the greatest benefit? Are, are you happy with Joseph Fire Prevention? And if none of your customers would care about the sheep, would it still make sense for you to keep them? Or is it the marketing aspect and maybe the meat and anything in between that really makes sense for you to do it? Where is the greatest benefit coming for you here? Yeah, I, I think the greatest benefit for us is, is again, the fire prevention. Um, as well as the marketability of, of the box lamb for some of our lamb, lamb, um, wine club members. Um, absolutely, you know, some of the other things that I don't think I added and, and I heard Carrie say earlier is um, these things are um, pretty amazing um, at the timing that you can bring them in. So as long as the grounds aren't too wet and to David's point, you're not overly compacting the soils, we get a lot of these really, really nice cover crops. And on a year like this year where we didn't have the rainfall we wanted, we're not going to have the forage we expected. The forage started late this year. Um, we're going to need a lot of these open fields that we've put cover crops in as they lay fallow or open for the season. Um, and we're going to need some of this feed to help, help supplement. So, um, marketability, um, fire prevention, but as well as just a reduction in labor costs. I mean, they, um, unfortunately, they've walked through a few of my vineyard blocks when I haven't had fences up properly, and they're incredible at leafing a vineyard, um, much more efficient than any of my labor. Um, so not that I needed that vineyard leaf that seriously, but uh, there's a huge opportunity for a reduction in labor if you use them properly. A good point and, and something that we strive here at the Napa Resource Conservation District and one of my many roles as the Sustainable Ag Program Manager is to incentivize diversity. Um, sustainability, it's not one domain fits all. It can be very different from different people, but what we have observed a lot is that by bringing diversity into your operations, whether it's the sheep pooping and peeing around or having to change your cover crop to meet your sheep needs and all of that, it's going to start bringing some benefits to your vineyard instead of having to rely heavily on just chemical or mechanical weeding. Uh, bringing the sheep will give you a benefit of uh, in just uh, um, improving your soil health in many aspects. Uh, mm -hmm. Something that just mechanical weeding and chemical weeding will not necessarily do. Um, I am a person that likes to think that it's important to have multiple tools in a toolbox. If you rely on one, sing one single tool, that tool might break and then you're in trouble. So sheep could be just another tool. You don't have to just jump into doing sheep completely. If you do and it works for you, great. But if you just incorporate it as another tool, I think you can definitely bring um, a little bit of, of benefits and diversity to your operation. Um, Miguel? Go ahead. I think to Jake's point about leafing, um, if you're set up correctly, they do an amazing job. There is less physical damage to the fruit with sheep coming in and leafing than there is humans coming in and leafing by hand, and certainly less mechanically. If I had, you know, a Pinot vineyard over on the coast and I had to leaf both sides of the canopy, um, I don't, and I had the correct trellis system to support the canes so they didn't get pulled down. Um, I don't think I'd hesitate to have sheep leave. I mean, I'll be very honest. We did it in two different vineyards, um, one of which was really strong, and they came in and they did a great job. It was a Chardonnay vineyard. It was a California sprawl, and um, it was fantastic. And then we had another vineyard that came through that 
catch wire was a little bit too high. I think it was about 15 or 16 inches above the core down. There were some weak shoots. Every single one of those weak shoots got ripped off. So you've got to select the block and everything just right, but it, it really it can be done. All right, I don't see any more questions from the audience. Uh, we'll go ahead and move on to our next uh, speaker. Uh, Jake, David, thank you so much for your perspective. Again, if you can uh, stick around with us, uh, with, with us just towards the end, maybe we'll have more questions. Uh, but if not, we totally understand and we really appreciate your time and being with us. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker, uh, and um, our speaker is going to go for about half an hour, 45 minutes, and then we'll have a break. So if, um, so you can please wait uh, until that time. We'll, we'll definitely give you guys a break before moving into our last uh, section. So uh, let's see here. So our next speaker. Um, it's Kelly Mulville, and he's a manager at Piscines Ranch, and we're very happy to have him. Um, they have a lot of experience incorporating sheep into their operations, so please, uh, please uh, help me welcome Kelly. Del Kelly, thank you so much for joining us today. Do we have you? I am here. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, and you're gonna, do uh, you wanna share your PowerPoint? Or do you have your PowerPoint? Okay, can everybody see that? Uh, not yet. Uh, it's coming and we got it. Okay. That's an awesome drawing. Oh, did we lose it there? Um, yeah, so if you can um, increase the page and then start your slideshow. There you go. There we go. We got you. Okay. Um, all right. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit here and try and not um, go over what a lot of the previous people have gone over. And my background is that I have been involved in grape growing, wine grape growing for about 20 years now. I started in Arizona. And before that, I was involved in. Um, basically in working with primarily ranchers. And so I had, I, I kind of came into it, into, into the whole grape thing with this, this understanding of ranching. In particular, I worked with um, people practicing holistic management and studied with Alan Savory for a number of years. And so I had a pretty good understanding of grazing. And so when I first got into growing grapes, I was particularly interested in, in how we might integrate livestock into, into grazing systems or into uh, grape growing systems. Um, so I am currently at Piscinus Ranch, which is just south of Hollister, California. The ranch is 7,600 acres. We have 600 acres of irrigated cropland, which includes vineyards. And then the remaining, the majority of the ranch is actually rangeland. We have a flock of uh, 700 Katahdin sheep. Katahdin is a hair breed, so they have wool, but it falls off naturally, it sheds. And um, we graze all of our cropland and all of the rangeland as well. So we're grazing, um, we're grazing quite a bit of irrigated cropland and we graze things like um, grain crops and we have some crops that are just forage crops um, and seed crops. Um, in the past I've also grazed orchards and vegetable crops in Colorado. Um, the, the whole ranch is certified organic. The sheep flock is managed organically. We do not use any warmers on our sheep um, because of our grazing management practices and the mineral supplementation and the breed, all of those combinations mean that we have a pretty, um, 
pretty maintenance or relatively maintenance free flock. Um, we just finished lambing about two weeks ago or so. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is basically I started out like a, a you know basically everybody that's been talking of using sheep during the non-growing season of the vines but um, I want to talk about what the benefits are of designing systems or adapting your system so that you can graze throughout the growing season and um, there's some considerable economic and ecological benefits and probably some we're seeing early signs of really good benefits for things like increasing soil carbon. Okay, so um, this first slide here is showing, so I've, I've worked in two different areas, one with summer monsoons, which is in the southwestern U.S., and then on the, in California on the, where we have a Mediterranean climate, and the um, the issue here, so we have this kind of orange box that's showing the time of year when we have to keep the sheep out of the vineyard because they, they love to eat grapevines, grape, grape leaves in particular. Um, and so the green curve is showing, the green area is showing when the forage, when the kind of the peak of forage growth is in either of these climates. And then the, the, the purple line inside there is showing the, the uh, growth pattern of the vines. So in either of these scenarios, we are basically excluding sheep when they have the highest potential. And if we could get sheep in there during that time, then my theory was that we could get a lot of benefits. Just from working with, with ranchers, um, we get really good nutrient cycling by having animals come in and eat that vegetation and turn it into dung, and in particular urine. We talk a lot about manure and, and cropping systems and compost, but really the highest value nutrient is the urine. So that's the benefit of having sheep directly into someplace like a vineyard and for as long as possible. Um, so one of the things that I'm really trying to get towards here then is something that is, that is working off of solar energy. So that it's driven by solar energy. Um, and taking that solar energy into green growing plants that photosynthesize and take carbon dioxide out of the air and put that carbon into the soil through root exudates. And so how do we capture that without damaging that? So the, um, the general practices in, in a lot of viticultural areas are that, that, that if they, A, hopefully they're growing, at least growing a cover crop, or have some kind of floor cover. And then when the vines start to leaf out and they need to start doing things like spray and things like that, then generally those are either tilled in or mowed. When you till in a cover crop, you're usually within probably about seven to 10 days losing 80% of the carbon that was in that, as well as quite a bit of the nitrogen. So what we're doing is we're kind of building up a, um, this great source of organic matter and fertility and by by tilling it in, we're greatly reducing the benefits of that, as well as doing damage to soils through the actual tillage. Um, this occurs in both conventional, biodynamic, and organic practices. This is a, more than likely a biodynamic vineyard. And you can see they're, they're doing a lot of great things in there, but they're still treating the soil as a annual system by using tillage in that. And so one of the things that I'm looking at is how do, we, how do we move beyond just this idea of having another tool and regeneratively manage vineyards so that we're, we're, we're not just doing less damage, but we're actually improving ecosystems. And I'm looking at that from a number of aspects from things like soil health, uh, economics, because if it's not economically viable, then people aren't going to do it. Um, and how do we increase biodiversity? How do we increase ease of management? And um, how do we make farming more fun so that we get people that want to go back into farming instead of everybody leaving it? So in order to accomplish this, the, the first thing that I developed was this offset system. 
And so this allows an existing vineyard, in particular, like a, 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 a VSP system, vertical shoot position system, to be grazed at any time of the year. This is a really simple system. There's an electric wire on either side of the uh, fruiting zone and just below the fruit. And um, where that's, where the length of that offset um, bracket there and the distance from the vine itself, from the cordon wire, varies depending on the size uh, of, the, of the vine and the height and a number of factors like that. But um, this was a system that I developed in order to trial in a vineyard in Sonoma County. And that trial was done in 2009 and 2010. Um, this is a rather poor photo, but you can see the offset system is in there before anything leafed out. And I did that just so that the sheep were trained to the electrified wire before um, any buds came out. One of the things to keep in mind about these, uh, about electric fence in general is that it is not a physical barrier. It is a psychological barrier. And so when, a, when an animal gets shocked, the, um, the, it, it doesn't really know what happened to it. And so it develops this fear and it's got this, so you have this kind of zone of fear around that, that electrified wire, which they will avoid. Um, the only thing I've had difficulty training to electric wires are young human males. So here is a, a shot showing the, um, the control site of this trial I did. And that's on the left side and the trial site on the right. Um, so I didn't have to do any mowing, any cultivating, no disking, no tillage. Um, didn't have to have a tractor in there for any reason because it was small enough that I could do my spraying by hand. Um, on the control site, you can see that there's weeds and that there's tillage occurring, which by the way, tillage leads to weeds. So if you want weeds, till by all means. Um, you can also see that there's no suckers on the trial side where I have the electrified offset. And that's because the sheep did all the suckering for me. One of the great advantages of that is that the sheep are in direct contact with the grapevine and I want that to occur. And one of the reasons for that is because that the, when, it, when a browsing or grazing animal has contact with a plant through grazing, um, it intends to impart benefits. One of, the, one of those is that in, it, it tends to improve regrowth or give the plant a little bit of a stimulation, but also it imparts disease and pest resistance. And the first documented accounts I read of that were actually with leafhoppers in grass species. Grass species that were grazed as opposed to mowed showed a really significant resistance to leafhopper damage. So that's a good thing going forward as we, as we continue looking into these systems that we're developing. Um, by basically trying to mimic nature um, and including animals in the systems for as much of the year as possible, there's probably a good possibility that we're gonna get unexpected benefits in things like disease and pest resistance. Um, one of our guiding principles in what we do is how, how do we look at these, these patterns and principles in nature and how do we mimic those? If you look at most agricultural operations, and fortunately, vineyards are becoming an exception to this because of, of what everybody's been talking about today and last week. Um, they're catching on to this idea of integrating animals into their systems. But in general, in, in agriculture, one of the first things we do is take all, all animals away from those systems. And I think, as you'll see in some of the other slides I showed, it's to a great detriment to our soil health and our, the general health of the ecology of these systems. Um, this is later in the year in that trial site. Um, and you can see that um, nothing above that, that hot wire there has been affected by the sheep. I actually shut the, the, the hot wire off for about two weeks in order to get, um, to see how long that psychological effect, that fear effect would last in case, for instance, your energizer got struck by lightning or something and you had to 
order a new one. I mean, I didn't have any trouble doing in, in this situation with keeping that off for a while. And as you can see, they don't really have much to eat below there, so I was kind of pushing them a little bit. So I want to quickly go over some of the advantages that came out of this trial. Um, there was an article on this um, trial published in Australia, New Zealand, Great Brewer Winemaker in about 2011. It was also published in Acres Magazine in this country and Stockham and Grass Farmer. But uh, some of the effects of that trial is that we eliminated the need for mechanical or hand cultivation, tillage, and uh, obviously tractor passes. And that was for the, um, th from December, actually from January through the end of June. And I took them off at the end of June just because we had no more, no, nothing else for them to eat in there by that time. Um, eliminated the need for hand suckering, converted all that, all those suckers into fertilizer. We reduced irrigation use. This was the big surprise by 80% compared to the previous year, which was managed uh, organically and biodynamically and just grazed during the growing season of the cover crop but not the growing season of the vine. Um, and, and so the, uh, the, and then we reduced the irrigation use by 90% compared to um, the control site, which was conventionally managed. Um, yield increased by 1,200 pounds per acre over average uh, yield that we'd had on that site for the previous about 10 years. Um, we basically eliminated the need to haul in any outside sources of fertilizer, compost, anything like that. And then the vegetation, instead of becoming a problem, things like weeds that we refer to problems, uh, anybody who is grazing sheep, especially hair sheep, knows that the very first thing that they will go for when you put them in a field are what we term weeds. And there's a reason for that because they tend to be very nutritious. Those are plants that are highly adapted to the environment that they're in. And so they're there for a reason. And because they're adapted to those environments, they tend to have high nutritional content. Um, as I mentioned, the uh, results of that trial were published in Australia, New Zealand Great Brewer Winemaker. Uh, consequently, I ended up, I was invited by, um, by government and wine and grape growing organizations in both countries to come down and do presentations. Um, the first vineyard to adopt that system as a managing approach to their entire vineyard is NSA Vineyards in Victoria. Um, Australia, and the town is NSA, and the name of the vineyard is NSA as well. And if you go to their website, they have a video showing what they're doing with the sheep. And they're in either their sixth or seventh year of using this. They've completely eliminated herbicides. And um, uh, every year I contact them to make sure everything's going okay. Everything is going okay with the sheep. They did not burn up this year, but they did not have a crop because of smoke taint. But fortunately, they did not. They did not suffer any direct fire damage. So I, I'm, I'm going to lead up here to some of the reasons why anybody would consider doing something like uh, grazing vineyards. There's uh, there's been a lot of discussion on today's talk about that, and um, in particular, I want to start with soil health principles, um, and move on from that to some things like economics. Um, but the, the, the whole regenerative agricultural movement basically started in the Midwest. And this, some of the principles that people have been putting together going along through this are, are, are the, these that I have listed here. And they're, they're pretty basic. And all of these are basically mimicking what nature does in healthy conditions that where we're not messing things up as humans tend to do. Um, the first one is just to keep the soil covered throughout the year. Um, that would be with either green growing plants or some type of mulch of, of dead plants or organic matter. Uh, the second is to minimize soil disturbance. This would include any form of tillage, uh, especially deep and frequent tillage. Um, plowing, um, ripping, things like that. Um, encourage diversity in plants, insects, soil, biology, all forms of life. 
um, because if you have high diversity, you generally have high stability. Um, we strive for high insect numbers, knowing that 98% of insects are beneficial or at least non-harmful to our crop plants. Um, and the fourth one is to have living roots, plants growing as much as possible throughout the year. Um, we have an unfair advantage in particular in California for this because we have this Mediterranean climate and so we can grow crops throughout the year. And so we can have a, we can have a cover crop during the non-growing season of the vines and then the vines are growing during the, the growing season, uh, the summer year. But we can also, uh, if we move on to an extended uh, grazing season, then any plants that are growing there are really not a concern because the sheep will be grazing them. And if they're not grazable, then they probably have good benefits such as pollinator sources or insect habitat, beneficial insect habitat. And then the last one that I have is to integrate livestock in your cropping systems. Um, I'm going to show a slide here that this, 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 this was done by the NRCS, a trial or a little research project by the NRCS, and I believe it was in North Dakota. There is a YouTube video on this, and um, it's, a, um, uh, it's a great example of what having well-managed livestock in a landscape does. So if you look at these, th these are basically soil core photos of soil cores. So the soil scientists went and, and with this tube that gets basically kind of drilled into the ground, he's able to pull out a section of soil. And these are probably a couple feet long. And he pulls them out of the ground and then he's able to look at and see what the soil structure looks like. Um, the, the first one is from what is termed well-managed grassland. And so that is one in which the livestock are being, they're using plant grazing, so they're moved frequently, they're kept in a pretty high bunch, and they're moved frequently to allow adequate rest for the soils and the plants above them. So that would probably mean that during the growing season they might graze, uh, well if it's North Dakota it could be pretty short, but they might only get two or three grazings in, but have anywhere from 40 to 60 days of rest between those grazings to allow the plants to recover. Um, and that's basically mimicking what the bison did up in those areas. So the bisons were in, were in huge herds. They moved frequently because they were in such big herds that they were fouling up the land that they were on through dunging and urinating and trampling. And they stayed tightly bunched because if they weren't in a bunch, then they got picked off by wolves or mountain lion or Native Americans. And so their behavior actually encouraged this beneficial effect upon the land and the soils. Uh, the second example is uh, season-long grazing. So that's where the animals were put in, say, at the start of uh, end of spring, start of summer, and left there th through the whole year. There was probably less animals in total, but they were on the same place for a long period of time. And you can see we're starting to lose a little bit of that nice aggregate structure of the soil, the pore space where life has where, where microbes. And, and earthworms and things like that have good access into the soil and, and air. Um, but it's still, compared to this last one here, it still looks fairly good. This last one was just recently converted the year before into cropland. And it was, um, it was no-till cropland. So what they probably did is went through with an herbicide and sprayed off all the native vegetation and then went in and planted, I would suspect it would be either corn or soybeans. So even though that was no till, you can see the immediate damage that occurred by having, um, by basically cutting off that solar cycling of nutrients into that, into that soil through the native vegetation. So that it probably immediately killed off those roots and, um, and you lost that soil structure. Um, the, uh, as I mentioned, again, there's a, this, this research uh, study is available on YouTube through the NRCS, and you can see more details of this. But the really interesting thing to me is they went back on these sites. So these are all within 200 feet of each other, same soil type, um, just different management practices. So they went 
and did a what's called a water infiltration test where they put a ring, a metal ring in the soil, pounded in the soil, and they put the equivalent of what would be an inch of water, so mimicking basically an inch of rainfall, um, into this ring and they time how long it takes for that to soak into the soil. And I may be off by a slight bit here, but on the converted cropland, it took about 32 minutes for an inch of water to get soaked into that soil. On the continuous season long grazing, it took about a little over seven minutes for an inch of rainfall to get absorbed into that, into that soil. And on the well-managed grassland, it took just a little over 10 seconds for that soil to absorb all that water. And so you can imagine if you wanted to, if, if, if well, say if you're looking at a, at a three inch rainfall over a period of an hour, you're going to have flooding on that converted cropland. You're gonna have flooding really quick because it, it just can't handle rain at that level. But if that happens on your well-managed grassland, then it's, it's not gonna be a problem at all. And what that means is that water is going into the soil and because it's well managed, the carbon levels are going to be higher. So it's water holding capacity is higher. So you've got numerous benefits occurring because of your management. So when I first saw that, it's basically a no brainer. How do you want to manage your crop land? Um, and it looks like one of the best tools to do that is by using well managed grazing animals. And so um, that's a pretty, um, I always say, when I'm doing presentations, if I only could show one slide, this is the slide that I would show because it dramatically shows the effect of integrating livestock into, um, into our ecological agricultural systems. This is some other research that I wanted to share because it's showing something that is pretty remarkable and we're starting to see that here and I'll share a little bit of the, of the results that we have from the soil testing we've done here. But this is from a, a, a group of farms also close, close to each other. This is in South Dakota, uh, I know this is in North Dakota as well. And um, they are all, so they have same soil type, it's just different management practices. And the, the N stands for nitrogen, the P stands for potassium, the K is, or, or, or phosphorus and the K stands for potassium. And the OC is um, organic organic material, organic, uh, uh, organic matter. So um, the, um, the, the, looking down the management side, we see that there's one that's organic, um, one that's no-till low diversity, one that's no-till medium diversity and high use of synthetic fertilizers. And then there's the last one, which is no-till high diversity, no synthetics, integrating livestock, and they also add cover crops. Um, the interesting thing is that the first three all use outside inputs in the form of fertilizers. And the last farm is not using any outside, is not using any fertilizers. So there's, uh, there's no fertilizers going into that soil, but you can see that their numbers are just off the charts compared to everybody else. And that's a really good indicator that by focusing on soil health, and doing things like using cover crops, um, having high diversity, and um, bringing in livestock, that we can dramatically increase the, what has to be the availability of the nutrients that are already there. Those other farms that are bordering, so these are all basically in the same neighborhood, they probably all have the same inherent potential, but the, the, that last farm is the one that's realizing that. And this last, and the, the the uh, farmer in the, the in the bottom here is Gabe Brown, and he's been at this for a while, about over 20 years, I think. So here's an example showing, um, this would be an aerial view of the vineyard. And even though those little brown things look like sheep turds instead of sheep, those are supposed to represent sheep. And I just wanted to show the difference between grazing continuously, which would be on the right side there, where the animals are scattered out around, and stay in, the, in one spot for an extended period of time to where you're doing um, higher density grazing, like on the left, where the animals are in a more confined area, but for a shorter time. 
And so this is showing that they moved basically from the top of the page there to the bottom. And the color change is, is, is indicating how the grasses and forbs recover. So that the, these would potentially be going back up to the top of the, of the left side where the grasses have recovered. On the right side, they go in there and it's like sending a bunch of teenagers into a pizza buffet. They're gonna eat all the stuff that they like best and then they're just gonna slowly eat the other things. So their nutritional plane will go down pretty quickly. But the other thing that happens is that they cause compaction. Um, they, they, they cause overgrazing. And some plants that they don't like will never get grazed, even though they may be highly palatable. But because they get old and dried and, and uh, their, their flavor goes down, they, they sometimes don't get grazed at all. So this is one of the reasons why it makes a lot of sense to graze in a way that mimics how native herds do, where they're in a more of a tight bunch, but they move frequently. It also, in, from what I see, it makes it more fun for the animals because they're going out to good feed um, on a more regular basis. This is an example of what not to do. This is during the end, this is just before bud break on a vineyard that had sheep on it throughout the growing season. They were in the same place for the entire time. Just on the outside of this where the, where the drill ran and, um, and the cover crop didn't get grazed, the cover crop was probably four feet high. But not only did they continuously overgraze this, they caused severe compaction. This is, this is on a slope. There's one rain after this and the, the, the field was highly eroded. And so all of the potential of taking those growing plants, cycling that carbon into the soil, building the roots up um, and feeding the microorganisms, increasing the water on the capacity, all of that was lost because of, because of this continuous grazing. So um, one last thing that I wanted to say um, about uh, that I did not mention in the in the slide on the advantages of that of that season extended season grazing is that the economic savings of that based off of all the benefits that occurred were five hundred dollars per acre per year. So um, and then, and those were realized in that particular situation because um, the sheep were purchased, but then at the end of the year they were sold. They were, they were either sold or put into my freezer. So, um, so because of that, the sheep were either a benefit for me by going into my freezer or they were, um, they were sold and so we recouped our, our money on the cost of the sheep. So, um, so the direct benefits, the direct savings of having those sheep in there for an extended season was $500 an acre. Um, in the area where I'm at, just on the other side of the mountain here, there's the majority of the vineyards are about a thousand acres. And so if you think about doing that type of extended season grazing in a uh, large area, you're looking at really significant labor and economic savings. So I'm gonna go into a, a quick um, run through of how we developed this vineyard here. Um, historically, Piscinas Ranch had a thousand acres of vineyards on it in the 60s, 70s and 80s. Um, it was part of Almaden Vineyards, which was a total of 6,000 acres, which is one of the largest vineyards in the world at the time. Um, and um, when I came here, um, I was hired to put in a vineyard. And um, this, this was the site that I chose. This was one of the areas that had been historically in, in, in grapevines. And I chose this site, this hillside, because it was facing north it had a little bit of example of perennials wanting to be at this site. Those are, that's coyote brush on, on the hillside there. Um, and it was fairly close to water and fairly close to headquarters. So it made a, a good site for, um, for the initial planting. The initial planting, uh, the, the initial size of the vineyard is 25 or 24 acres. And the, um, the, uh, the first phase was, a uh, uh, first planted phase was 20. And the second will be this year's another 12 acres. We did um, a light compost application after smoothing out the ground. And the first year, we did not put in a cover crop 
we've got the equivalent of seven animal days per acre. That's the equivalent of a thousand pound animal, animal on one acre for a day. And so that's about what was average on the rangeland at that time. So we didn't really see a whole lot of benefits from just the compost on that first year. And this was in, this was in anticipation of planting. We wanted to do this, this integrating livestock in order to increase the, um, the soil health. The second year, we included the addition of a, of a cover crop. Still no fertilizers and no, no additional compost applications. We had about the same amount of rainfall, which is pretty low here. Our average rainfall is about 12 inches. We rarely see that. And but our, our crank capacity went up by tenfold. So we had 70 animals a per acre on this uh, in the second year. And I wanted to show you this picture and go back to the previous one because to, just to show what mimicking nature looks like. And you can see that picture of bison. Obviously, that's not a historic pic picture, but that's how bison graze. And we were just mimicking that same system here. And so um, you can see that um, basically we're keeping the, uh, the livestock bunched pretty tightly. It's not like they don't have room to get around, but it enables them to graze, graze through the area quickly. And then we can give it a much longer rest period. And they tend to graze more evenly than two. It's kind of like there's a little competition for what's available. Um, this is the vineyard site after that, after that second year of grazing. Uh, we're not on our knees in that photo. The, uh, some of the cover crop was over eight feet tall. So the um, productivity went up pretty dramatically there. Um, this is showing the site now um, we have planted. Um, in order to, um, to do extended season grazing any time of the year, we're using a, a taller divided canopy system it's basically a raised VSP system. The fruiting wire is at about 66 inches. Um, and the, uh, you can see the irrigation hose is just about 10 inches below that. That allows access in any direction for sheep and actually humans too. Um, I can, I, if I need to, I can take a, a, a mower and go under, right underneath the, the drip line there. So I can go both directions. Our spacing is 12 feet uh, between rows and six feet between vines. This particular variety is Grenache. Um, about half of this first version is Grenache. We also are doing, um, uh, we have a little bit of Cabernet, a little bit of Syrah, some Cunois, Carignan, Cinso, and um, we'll be grafting Mencia onto a section this year. And for whites, we have Assertico, Verdejo, and Picpoul Blanc. Uh, we're using rootstock of 1103P and 110R. Our hope is that as we increase our water holding capacity, that we will be able to, um, to, um, to dry farm during, during years where we get enough rainfall for that. So if we've got 12 inches of rain, we're hoping to be able to dry farm in that. Um, so we have been keeping track of soils, our, our soil on the site since before planting. We did about 25 pits on the sites that we're looking at planting, probably about 15 or so are on the sites that we have planted. And so we have records going down to six feet. Um, we did soil, um, soil lab analysis, usually at three points on each of those pits. Um, one of the, so, so we're seeing increases in availability of just about all nutrients. And um, we are also seeing a pretty dramatic increase in soil organic matter and soil carbon. I just did some calculations for an article, uh, for a writer who's doing an article. And we, our soil organic matter went up by uh, 1%, a little over 1% in our first three years of, before we even planted actually. And, um, so that equates to about somewhere around 20,000 gallons per acre increased water holding capacity. So on the 24 acres, uh, we're looking at right around 500,000 gallons increased water holding capacity because of our management practices. Um, we've done that 
with a with without tractors without without a lot of inputs we, i mean we've had very few inputs on this um, the only fer fertilizer inputs we've done have been gypsum and um, that initial compost application um, we have done some foliar calcium on our vines just to try and mitigate the high bulk levels that we have in our in our, um, in our water this so that last slide was from last summer uh, this year we're expecting our first commercial crop and this is uh, showing the vineyard during the dormant season and you can kind of see the end assembly there um, and we are we grazed the vineyard twice this past winter um, and because the vines are still young we won't be able to graze during the growing season until next year's our anticipated first year of grazing throughout the year uh, another view of the vineyard you can see we, we actually tried two different methods for 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 the creating the v effect for those vines uh, one was an actual v and the other is just two parallel arms but it, it, it basically positions those catch wires at the same place And one final shot where you can give a little more perspective there. This is an area that's going to be grafted to Mencia this year. We're selecting varietals that are that tend to be from warm climate growing areas because we are definitely seeing the effects of climate change here. Which uh, one so that that reminds me that one of the things that's um, uh, really kind of exciting about this trellis system is that it's doing a, a number of things. It's going to be providing partial shade. Um, it's, um, we don't have to, so because we're, we're training the spurred, uh, they're alternating directions in order to create the V, we can leave all the spurs on there. And so that should increase our, um, our, our yield per vine, even though our yield um, we have less vines per acre. We're expecting our yield to still be pretty, pretty comparable to a higher density planting. Um, that's what they're seeing where this system is used, which is mainly in Texas. Um, but in addition, by coming up higher, we're going to be a little bit cooler. By having overhead canopy, we're going to have less direct sunlight, which will also help the cooling effect. The shade effect on the ground will help keep things cooler. Um, we're also going to be less prone to frost because we're up higher off the ground. And, um, and the idea is by having this system up higher, we, don't, we, don't, we actually don't have to use the electrified wires. So um, the first system I developed was for existing vineyards or for vineyards that might not necessarily want to use this high system. But this one is designed specifically so that we can graze at any time of the year and not have to use an electrified deterrent system. Um, we are already seeing a, a huge influx of, especially uh, bug eating birds like bluebirds and swallows because they have these, these posts to perch on. And then the raptor population is also taking advantage of those as well. Um, the kind of the perspective we're coming from at the ranch in general, but especially on this um, vineyard, is can be summed up in this quote that Buckminster Fuller made, and it's that basically it, you never change you never change things by fighting what exists. That if you want to change something, create a model that makes the existing model obsolete. Um, what we are hoping, and we're going to be doing a trial this summer, if we could spray this vineyard with a drone. With like one of the Yamaha drones, and Yamaha has been out here, and they're particularly interested in seeing how this works here. If we can effectively spray this vineyard, then we anticipate that we have a model that would be uh, able to function with almost zero tractor use. The only time you might need to have a tractor in the vineyard would be for harvesting, and for our purposes, if we do go to drone spraying, um, then we would just use a quad for harvesting. So we would never have to have a tractor in here. So we would um, conceivably um, have eliminated the need for a tractor in a vineyard. 
Um, there's a lot of other factors that we're working on here um, related to this design aspect. Um, but the other thing I wanted to mention on economics is that, so we have a, we currently have a flock of 700 sheep. We're looking at increasing that to about a thousand ewes, which will give us about two to 3,000 sheep on the ranch um, each year. Um, we are currently doing direct sales of lamb. And so our means of managing the vineyard is also an income source. So we're literally stacking enterprises and we've kind of raised the vineyard up above our grazing land, which has increased the quality of the grazing land. And by grazing the vineyard, we're increasing the quality of both the grapes, the, the fruit itself, and the potential for yield and um, reducing a huge amount of input costs. So we're looking at kind of a win-win situation by following um, basically this idea, this concept of how do we mimic nature. So this, uh, that's basically it for my presentation. I'd love to give these resources if anybody is interested in looking further. Uh, uh, the bottom two are in particular for grazing management and um, the um, the uh, top one is Piscinus Ranch and the second one is a is a website that I have that's devoted in particular to uh, vineyard grazing. All right. Thank you so much for all of that, Kelly. Very, very interesting. Uh, we do have a few questions to address. Um, uh, somebody's asking if you have seen any reduction in insect pests pressure due to the presence of the sheep. Um, we're not sure yet. So far, we haven't had any insect pressure, <laughs> and so um, it, it's a little bit hard to 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 to, to say. And in this particular situation, we don't we don't have a control. We just the, the entire vineyard is being managed by this. Um, one of the things that we're looking at, we're in the process right now of putting together a SIG on farm trial um, grant application. And the intention is to look at is to do side by side studies of, of um, extended season grazing with uh, dormant season grazing and um, and just conventional management. So looking at those three different systems and what we see in kind of side by side comparisons of that. But so far we have not had insect, um, we have not had any insect issues. Have you had any experience with um, bringing foreign sheep or contracting a company? Somebody's uh, wondering about mealybug or other pets being transferred by the sheep themselves. I've, I've had that question before. Um, I've not experienced that. Um, I, I guess if, it's, if, if mealy bug got on a sheep's, you know, in, in sheep wool and it was transported and was able to get back off and onto an existing, uh, on, on a new vineyard, that could be a possibility. I don't think it's very likely, um, but, and, and it would, you know, it would be difficult to, um, to actually to see if that's a possibility. But um, I guess it, it could be tested just by actually getting a mealy bug and putting it on a sheep and monitoring that sheep for a while and seeing that it could survive. But um, um, for instance, we don't, we, don't get eat, we don't even get ticks on our sheep. So I think they're, they're fairly hardy to insects. Um, and I suspect it might have something to do with the lanolin, which is in the wool. It might be kind of an insect deterrent. Interesting. Um, somebody is wondering about your water uses reduction. What do you attribute or how did you measure that reduction in irrigation? Okay, that's a great question and one that commonly gets asked. But um, I'm going to go back to that uh, the slide I showed of the, um, of the um, three different soil cores and the one where they're using grazing showing how the water uh, the water holding water infiltration capacity increased pretty dramatically. Um, the interesting thing was is that we got that in the first year of extended season grazing. Um, we only had a 10% increase over the previous year where we were doing dormant season grazing. 
And so I think that part of that, there's a couple things going on there. The, 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 the ground, we had better ground cover. So the soil was covered, which helps conserve the water that it is in the soil. Um, we might have been getting a residual effect from the previous years of grazing, just during the dormant season. And then um, the, uh, perhaps the, the, the combination of the urine and all of those other factors, so the urine being kind of a, this direct application of, um, of a liquid fertilizer source enabled uh, the, the reduction of water use too. Um, the, the, I guess what I'm getting at is that we really don't know what happened there to increase those dramatic uh, reduction in water use, but it was, um, and, and then simultaneous increase in yield, but that was a, a kind of an, an unexpected and pretty exciting benefit of that. That is a very interesting point. And like we have mentioned, uh, there's a lot of science investigation going on as far as uh, the specific effects of incorporating sheep into the vineyard. Uh, Dr. Amelie Gaudin and her graduate student, Kelsey Brewer, from our presentation on Friday, talk a little bit about the mechanisms by which they believe this is happening. Uh, but one thing that I can say is, I think what Kelly is seeing is just a general improvement on soil health which uh, once you improve your soil health, once you improve your organic matter, aggregate stability, um, all of those physical properties and biological as well and chemical in the soil, you will see benefits in water absorption. So it might be a combination of a lot of different things. Uh, we will actually be hosting another workshop sometime in June dedicated entirely to soil health. So I really encourage everybody to uh, sign up for the newsletter so that you know exactly when that workshop will come out and we'll have a more thorough communication about that. But uh, it's, it, it would be hard, like Kelly says, to pinpoint exactly. It might be just a synergistic effect on all the things that are happening. But it's important to see that you, Kelly, are seeing these important, important benefits, uh, which I think a lot of people would be <clears throat> uh, concerned about or curious about if they decide to incorporate the sheep. So that is definitely very interesting. Congratulations on bringing up your soil health and hopefully you can continue it. Um, a couple of the questions here. Um, some people are asking if you like to have bigger groups of sheep for a short period of time versus a smaller group of sheep for a longer period of time. What do you recommend works best um, I would definitely recommend larger group of sheep for a shorter period of time. And that, that's all relative to the size of your vineyard. So if your vineyard's two acres, then a large group of sheep might be five. But if, you're, if, you're, if your vineyard is a thousand acres, then, um, then you're gonna be dividing that up into a lot of sections and moving them pretty quickly. And I, I generally am looking at a, at a stocking rate of about 200 sheep per acre. It's, it, it's, it's, um, it's fairly ideal for most of the situations that, that I've been working in. And we do, um, in addition to the grazing of our own vineyards, we are uh, grazing, doing grazing up at Calera Vineyards as well, which is basically in our, in our neighborhood here. And so that is just grazing during the dormant season. But, um, and because of our wacky winter this year with no rainfall in February, we weren't able to get up to, to that density because of the lack of, of, of grazing forage. But um, in, in, in general, we can get up to about 200 sheep per acre and then usually moving as often as once a day. Um, I've moved, um, I've done situations where I'll move twice in a day and sometimes I'll just stay in an area for maybe a couple of days. But in general, I don't like staying in an area for more than a couple of days because um, the, the effects of compaction are going to be accentuated with time. And one animal left in a thousand acres can do more compaction than a thousand animals in that thousand acres that are, that are moved frequently and allowing the land to rest. So it's, it's really uh, both overgrazing and compaction are a function of time. So the, anything that you can do to reduce your time is going to be favorable, both for soil health and for, for the health of your vegetation on that soil. 
Very, very interesting. And it, it comes back to the same theme that I think we're hearing that it is a lot of work to bring the sheep and it's a little bit of a dance and every year might be different. Hopefully through this workshop, we can convince you that there's great benefits. So that at least you would consider it as another tool for your toolbox. Uh, someone uh, would like to know if you uh, establish a specific cover crop for your sheep and how do you establish that cover crop if you do um, so it, it, the, the cover crop mix, if I'm, if I'm planting a cover crop, will depend on um, where, I'm, where I'm doing that particular cover crop. So there's, I, I don't think there's any recipe that, is, that will work for everywhere. Um, the one thing that I would encourage is diversity and to not be afraid of the weeds that you might have in your, in your, um, in your vineyard because those are going to be very desirable to the sheep. And I have grazed grazed vineyards that don't have a cover crop at all. They're just, it's whatever is coming up in there. And the sheep do fine on that. Um, and so what, uh, what we are using here primarily includes things like oats. And we've been growing oats for seed. We've been growing oats and triticale for seed on, on some of our cropland. So we've used both of those. But I'm particularly fond of oats. Uh, especially the, the, the grazing oat like um, uh, Montezuma. And um, we also use vetch, uh, crimson clover. If there's any compaction issues or if you just want another excuse for diversity, I like to use daikon radish, which has a nice big root. It's like a big plug of carbon going down into your soil. Um, and I'll use, I've, I'll, I'll use some pollinator plants I like to put in California poppy and phacelia. Um, and slowly, we're also seeing an increase in the native plants as we, as we graze these sites. We're seeing it both on the rangeland and in the vineyard as we, as we improve our grazing practices, a lot of the native plants are coming back in. Uh, and we're especially seeing a lot of stuff during the summer, you know, the usual things like um, turkey mullein, but also some things like milk vetch are becoming more predominant, which are great for, um, uh, nectar sources for insects, so we're seeing a lot of insects uh, on those on those plants during the summer. Very interesting. And one thing to think about as well is that sheep may be less picky than we think, at least from my experience. In our trial sites in Carneros, we have two separate uh, trials. One where we uh, have permanent cover crop, non-till, and then we have a typical uh, tilled uh, cover crop mix. And we do have a lot of uh, weird pressure. We actually went uh, two years ago, we stopped using Roundup completely and have been going for a more organic approach with a lot of mechanical weeding before the sheep came in. Uh, so by the time that the sheep came in, we did have a lot of weed pressure and they just eat everything. They keep it nice uh, down. Um, I like Kelly's analogy, they do look like a, a golf course sometimes. Um, so keep in mind that as well. And if you are thinking of just contracting a company, then maybe you don't really have to worry about that, but communicate with them to make sure that um, everything will be fine. Um, Kelly, a couple more questions. Somebody is wondering if uh, you only use hair sheep or if you have considered using sheep that you can get wool from so that you have grapes, meat and wool. Uh, yes, we have considered using wool sheep as well. Um, we haven't we haven't come across a breed that we think would work well on our rangeland, in addition to in, in, in the vineyards. But that is something we've thought of, of actually establishing a separate flock that is that is a wool flock, and we are still looking at still looking at that as a possibility. But that that could be a possibility. Um, I've yet to have um, lamb or sheep meat that compares to the quality of the Katahdins. And um, so there might be, at least from a culinary perspective, a little bit of a, of a ding by going with a, with a wool sheep there. But um, I'm, I haven't tried all the breeds, so um, there's definitely an opportunity for that to, to happen. And then also some people, uh, the hair sheep in general tend to be milder in their flavor. Mm -hmm. And um, some people like the the, the gamier sheep taste, but um, yeah, I think I think um, I think wool sheep 
uh, in the right conditions would do fine. Again, we're organic, and so it's a, it's a little bit easier to run hair sheep in an organic situation. We don't dock tails, um, and we find that the hair sheep tend to be hardier for things like parasites and just being out on the rangeland. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, so you mentioned that you raise your irrigation lines uh, just to make sure that the, the sheep can um, graze freely. Have you seen any increases in compaction due to just moving the drape higher, having a greater impact on every drop? Any erosion or compaction um, that you've seen as an effect of this? Uh, I have not seen any. Uh, there might be a, a slight bit of compaction just where the actual drop falls if the ground is bare there. And um, initially, so our, our emitters are spaced 18 inches on either side of the vine. And initially we put an, a, a tube, a spaghetti tube going from the emitter down to the vine when the vines were small so that the water was concentrated right at the, at the young plant. Um, we're, if the plants mature, we're taking those off. And there, there, we tended to have a little bare ground just keeping the, the, the vines weed free usually with a hoe um, for the young vines. And so that uh, we would see a little bit of, you know, like maybe the size of, uh, oh, maybe four inch diameter or so right there, if there was bare ground. But now we've gotten to the point where we have almost no bare ground in the vineyard and we're using our emitters. And so we don't, uh, we're not seeing any compaction there. And we're definitely not seeing compaction from sheep, in fact, or from our, our management practices. Um, Kelsey, who presented at, your, at, your, at the previous workshop, has been out here and done some testing for us. And I remember asking him, I said, how's the compaction looking? He said, you have no issue with compaction out here, that's for sure. So uh, the, um, in general, um, our compaction has gone way down from the previous management of just it being rangeland. That, that's the same thing that we're seeing. We did not raise our emitters, but we were concerned about just the hooves creating compaction and we did not see anything um, really concerning. So it's good to hear that. Uh, somebody's curious about how your sheep have done with star thistle and foxtail. Um, so um, star thistles, the, our sheep will eat the star thistle flowers and they will also nibble on the plants when they're really young, um, but they will, completely consume the flower. Um, and we, in, and as far as foxtail, when it's, before it's headed out, they'll eat, the, they'll eat the grass for sure. It's a pretty, pretty desirable grass species before it heads out. And our, the, the, what we're working on from our perspective here is that um, we, d we don't approach weeds as problems, we approach them as symptoms. So if we have weeds, um, then it's a symptom of our management. And oftentimes they will be indicators of, um, of compaction, of um, low organic matter, of high nitrogen, high nitrates, um, high salt, so different things like that. So in general, they're a indicator of our management or maybe it just inherent conditions in the soil. So what we're really looking at is how do we, how do we manage the ecosystem as a whole so that we move beyond the, the successional level or the desirable level for these weed species to exist in. And we're finding that that's, that's pretty successful, that we just manage not against the things that we don't want, but for the things that we do want. And we may have issues with star thistle or, or some other what is termed a weed in places for a while, but we see that those pretty quickly disappear. Interesting. Uh, last question for you, Kelly. Somebody's wondering if you know anybody in the Central Coast um, that will rent sheep and if you do consultations. Okay, so we are we're actually in the Central Coast and we have, um, we're probably at the point, we'll be at the point next year where we can start renting sheep to other people. Um, and uh, yes, um, I do consultations. Awesome. Uh, maybe you want to go in the chat box and put your best contact information so that people can have that if they have uh, interest in the Central Coast. Okay. All right, Kelly. Well, thank you very much. We really appreciate your perspective. Uh, we're going to go ahead and take a small break. Um, uh, let's take 10 minutes of a break. And then when we come back, 
Uh, we're going to have a short presentation uh, with Rebecca Burgess from uh, Fibershed and Sarah Tiffany from the Climate Smart Farming Program Specialist. And then we'll have an opportunity for um, opening up more questions. So please uh, go ahead and take a 10 minute break. We're going to go ahead and just pause everything here and um, just mute our microphones and we'll be right back in 10 minutes. Thank you very much, everyone. Hit the record button again. Here we go. Uh, welcome back, everybody. It looks like we only lost about 10 people in the process. Hopefully, they will come back. Uh, but let's go ahead and get started. Um, so now we're going to change gears just a little bit. Um, I wanted to get an opportunity to get other perspectives from other organizations that are doing work related to sheep. So one of them, as you may know, is Fiber Shed, and the other one will be the Climate Smart Farming Program. Um, a calf for short. So uh, Sarah and Tiffany, if I have you, would you please let me know? I know Sarah, you were here earlier. Are you back with us yet? Hi, yeah, I'm here. Okay, uh, what about you, Rebecca? Do we have you yet? I do not see Rebecca. So let's go ahead and get started with you, Sarah. Um, just go ahead and tell us a little bit about CAF and uh, how you've been involved. Uh, full disclosure, CAF, it's, it is one of our sponsors and it's a great partnership that we've been having with them with uh, different projects and we're very happy to have them here today. Uh, Sarah, go ahead, uh, tell us what you wanna tell us. Yeah, hi everybody, um, great to be with you all. Um, been really enjoying hearing from the different producers, um, met some of them, um, but it's always great to review all of the grow perspectives and experiences people have. Um, so I work for the Community Alliance of Family Farmers, otherwise known as CAF. And with that organization, I run our Climate Smart Farming Program. Um, I'm going to share a couple slides here real quick, um, if I can. And... Um, the Climate Smart Farming Program is really trying to work with uh, growers to uh, promote agroecological farming systems. And really, um, oftentimes it starts with integrating one practice, say, you know, low hanging fruit like cover crops or applying compost. Um, but ultimately, we're trying to um, work with folks to have more and more integrated systems. And one of the integrated systems that we work on. Um, with Napa RCD, with uh, Amelie Godin's lab at UC Davis, um, as well as some UC vet meds people at UC Davis is integrated crop live stock systems. Um, so um, yeah, I know that Amelie covered a, a lot of kind of her research that she's done on the, the vineyards up in the North Coast. Um, and we're an active partner in those, in those projects. Um, and actually, we carried out a lot of the interviews for the Barriers and Motivations to Adoption Survey, which took place in uh, Napa, Lake, Mendocino, and Sonoma counties. Um, and as a result of those and kind of ongoing partnerships with some producers, we're actually working on a number of case studies um, to, to really hide, highlight the, the best management practices that, that producers have come up with over the course of many years. Like you, you know, we just heard from Kelly Mulville who has um, over the course of his experience really been able to highlight what works and what doesn't. And um, we at CAF, you know, we take a very a uh, strong approach to farmer to farmer knowledge sharing and, and experience sharing in addition to um, rigorous, um, you know, data and uh, looking at things through the perspective of soil health and particularly and we tried to bring those two things together. Um, so I just wanted to basically chime in and and let you guys know that, um, you know, we are organization working in this area. Um, we work looking at the integrated sheep vineyard systems, uh, but we are also looking at other integrated crop livestock systems, um, including, you know, annual systems where you have, say, a pasture poultry rotation as part of your 
annual crop rotation, or say you bring in sheep after uh, harvesting a broccoli crop. Um, uh, other systems that we're looking at include um, integrating sheep into orchards. And I know there were some questions about that. And if people want to reach out to me, I'd love to get in touch. Um, and we're, we're actually starting next, well, later this year, we're going to be starting a, um, a research case study on, on grazing sheep in uh, organic walnut orchards. Um, and be getting some really good data on that. Um, so generally speaking, you know, even though we know um, that the theory and the data thus far really support um, the fact that integrating sheep into a cropping system is going to uh, really amplify the, the soil health benefits, particularly if you're combining that with cover crop plantings, what we've seen so far is is that cover crop plantings are great by themselves um, depending on how you manage them they can definitely add carbon to the system uh, but you bring an animal in there to graze and if done correctly the benefits of that cover crop are really tremendously amplified through the integration of that sheep um, in part because as the sheep eat the cover crop and then poop and pee the carbon that's remained um, that remains in, in the vineyard as a result of going through the sheep's body is actually more stabilized than if you were just to mow the cover crop and leave it on top or even incorporate it. Um, so we're really interested in long-term carbon sequestration as a result of these systems um, through a lot of the principles that were covered earlier. Um, and you know, the last thing I'll just point out is that um, or reiterate really is, is that even though, you know, the scientific principles and to some extent the data is there, um, there's not a whole lot of resources for folks that want to start doing integrated crop livestock systems. Um, there's more than anywhere in California, there's a lot of people working on sheep and vineyards, but not so much in other systems. So um, that's really the reason that we are um, carrying out these case studies to look at best practices and also look at um, the economic benefits that that people are able to identify. Um, it was mentioned uh, to some extent earlier, but uh, just a little snippet from our barriers and motivations to adoption survey that we did in the North Coast. Um, I think we found, I'm looking at my notes here, that um, just looking at mowing savings alone um, having sheep graze uh, ended up saving folks between $87 and $174 per acre um, of the folks that we interviewed. And for, for people that were actually using sheep to do leaf plucking, it was a savings of up to $643 per acre because leaf plucking is so labor intensive. Um, the majority of the, the benefits that we're hearing reported uh, through this practice in vineyards is, is around labor and around soil health, and I think um, a, as well as marketing, which a number, number of the producers mentioned. Um, so the last thing I'll, I'll really say is um, if you are experimenting with uh, integrating sheep or any other livestock animal, into your cropping system, whether it's a vineyard or an orchard or an annual row crop system. Um, we'd love to hear your story and get in touch. We're really about connecting producers with other producers and, and having everybody kind of learn together and as research comes in, keeping folks informed. Um, so there's, a, there's an email down here at the bottom, climatesmartatcalf.org. I can also put my email here in the chat box. Um, the last thing I'll say is the, um, we, we did put a, together a little fact sheet based on the barriers and motivations to adoption survey um, and some of the work that came out of the study with Amelie and Kelsey. Um, I'm happy to share this with folks who are interested, so feel free to email me or perhaps uh, Miguel can share this on the, the email with the, the video link to the, the Zoom call. And um, with that, I'll uh, let the let Fiber Shed go ahead or take any questions, whatever you think, Miguel. Thank you very much, 
Sir, uh, we actually won't have uh, Rebecca. Uh, today there was some miscommunication. Uh, originally, we were going to do this in person, and then we had to modify everything to be a webinar. So uh, it was bound to be something that fell through the cracks, and this is what happened for us. So I really apologize. Um, if anybody has any questions for Sarah and Cap in general, we, you guys can put it on the chat box. Um, otherwise, I'll begin wrapping up everything, uh, but feel free to keep uh, asking questions. If I don't see any more questions, then we'll just end. Um, but somebody had a, uh, an important question earlier today that uh, didn't really fit in with the other speakers that I figure I would address myself a little bit. Uh, but somebody's asking me, uh, how do you approach local growers, producers about integrating sheep in the vineyards or farms? How do you start the conversation, especially if you live in a state that hasn't adopted as many regenerative organic practices as California? This is a great challenge uh, uh, as a person that has worked with growers for a long time. And my, my job is literally to disseminate information and bring it to you. My job is not to tell you how to farm. I'm a soil and water scientist by training. I did grow up in a small farm, but I don't pretend to understand all the complexities that go with farming. That's, that's your expertise and that's your job as growers. But one thing that I can tell you is that uh, we at the Napa RCD, we do try really hard to reach out to everyone uh, with these kind of workshops, with uh, just technical assistance. This is just one of the many things that we do. We're trying to uh, reach out to as many growers as possible. And when it comes to something novel like this, where not many people in Napa and not many people in California in general incorporate sheep into their operations, but yet we're seeing more and more scientific evidence pointing towards the benefits of incorporating the sheep. Um, I think it's important to just bring the information like we're doing right now through a workshop and keep the conversations going. Um, one thing that I do recommend, and for those of you who know me probably have noticed this about me, but I, I don't like pushing people to do things. I like providing you with the information so that you can make informed decisions because only you understand the intricacies of your operation. However, uh, one thing that I do suggest, if there's something new that we are trying to propose or something new that you've heard from somebody else, but yet uh, you're a little bit um, hesitant or scared to try new things, uh, try it a small scale. If you are worried about the sheep, uh, don't bring 300 sheep, bring a couple and try in one of your blocks. If you're trying to experiment with uh, other things like no-till or modifying your cover crop, try it in a couple rows. Uh, that way there's a little bit of less risk. We are very fortunate that we have uh, Wichita Creek Vineyard that we own and manage and operate because we can have these kind of experiments without, uh, I mean, we take all the risk and yeah, sometimes we might not make as much money out of it as we want, but the benefit that it has for the community is tremendous. So we want to continue uh, with these kind of workshops. We want to continue trying different, um, we, we want to try different experiments, different tries that will help you improve your operation. So if you are scared of trying something, I encourage you to talk to us and most likely we'll be able to try it for you in our vineyard or we might be already trying it in our vineyard. So we are here to serve you. We were here for you and we want to hear what, um, what is important to you and what kind of workshops we want to try. Uh, the best way possible is to uh, reach us directly over email, sign up for a newsletter. We have a calendar on our website where all of these events um, I, I would use this opportunity to promote a little bit of what's coming ahead, but we do our, after this workshop, I'm going to begin planning a soil health workshop, which will be a whole day dedicated to just soil health. I'm also going to be working on an irrigation management workshop to understand how to better manage your irrigation. Um, my coworker Ruby Stahel is working on a weed uh, management workshop with our local weed management expert, John Roncaroni. Uh, we have a lot of very interesting stuff going on, and we will always try to reach out to everybody. But if you are signed up to our newsletter, you will definitely uh, be ahead of the curve and get every single uh, new event that we're having. So I really encourage you to do that. Uh, as I said, uh, we were supposed to have Rebecca Burgess from um, Fibershed talking to us a little bit, and due to a miscommunication, most likely my fault, um, she was not able to attend, but we have uh, somebody else 
uh, please forgive me for the pronunciation, but we have like Need Nybridge, and she said she's willing to take uh, some questions or try to uh, address them if anybody has comments for Rebecca from Fiverr Shed. Um, uh, Lynette, uh, let me unmute you here, or maybe you can try to unmute yourself. Yeah, hi. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, okay. I don't think I have the pleasure to meet you. Uh, are you uh, with Fiverr Shed? Yeah, I'm, so I'm the Carbon Farm Planning Manager for both Carbon Cycle Institute and Fiverr Shed. Um, so I help a lot of, with Fiverr Shed, I help with their small producer program. And um, I also help with educational out outreach materials um, and I do speak on behalf of them at times. So if anybody has any um, questions or if anyone wants to know a little bit more about Fiverr Shed or their program, I'm happy to answer those or put you in contact with somebody that can um, provide feedback and answers for you. Uh, can you just briefly tell us what uh, Fiverr Shed role is and kind of like what the work do in general? I think that's all Rebecca was going to mention anyways. Okay, um, so Fiverr Shed is a nonprofit organization and we partner with um, Carbon Cycle Institute, which many of you might know both organizations. Um, and what we do is we help um, support the um, small producers who are in the program um, by um, providing them with um, educational and outreach materials to help with their operations. Um, right now we have about 180 members um, in Fiverr Shed and those are both artisans and um, fiber or dry growers. Um, and one of the things that Rebecca has been working on um, in uh, since she started this endeavor, is connecting um, fiber producers with um, brands um, and being able to um, build this um, climate beneficial model that they have. And I wish I had the diagram for all of you to see, but um, connecting um, artisans, producers um, with a mill and being able to clothe ourselves within our one geographical region, which is the fiber shed itself, um, similar to a food shed and a watershed. Um, and one of the programs that um, we have right now is um, we have um, the climate beneficial program where uh, we are able to help with carbon farm planning to help um, these producers figure out what type of potential there is on their landscape. And by connecting them with the brands and um, other funding sources, we're able to start to do implementation um, on these farms and ranches. Um, and that's um, without being prepared, that's pretty much um, <laughs> what I can uh, say right now. <laughs> no, that's great, but, um, that's great. I, I appreciate you jumping here. Um, not many will commit suicide like that. Um, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Um, somebody is actually asking about your informational material. Uh, would mm -hmm. you please uh, ch uh, put a note on the chat box and maybe uh, if you are comfortable with it, sharing your contact information and maybe Fiverr Shed's uh, website so that they yeah. can um, actually reach out? Yeah, of course. Um, so some of the outreach material we have that I've been working on right now is um, it, right now it's in um, a beta format, but um, a small farms um, workbook for doing carbon farm planning on smaller acreages um, just to help guide the producer and um, and understanding what their potentials are. Um, and some of the other uh, information materials that we have out right now are, are I guess, we'll be distributing soon our um, practice information similar to what um, um, was shown by CAF. Um, we have these flyers um, that are of different practices that talk about how you can implement, what you can implement, um, what the costs are and um, benefits of that sort. So um, those will be coming out soon as well. Awesome, thank you so much. So I'll give you a minute to be able to add that information and 
with that, uh, I will go ahead and conclude this workshop. Thank you very much, everybody. Please visit NapaRCD.org if you're interested on the newsletter. Uh, Lynette just uh, shared her uh, email address and the website for FiberShed will be just FiberShed.com. So if you're interested on in incorporating chip into your vineyard, you already are, you want to go in the business of maybe creating fiber, uh, FiberShed would be a great nonprofit. Highly, highly recommend that we do a lot of uh, collaborations with them. They're awesome people and I love the work that they're doing. So with that, thank you very much, everybody. We really appreciate your time being here. Stay tuned for our next workshops. Stay safe out there. Please don't go outside if you don't need to. If you do go outside, make sure that you take the precaution necessary to protect yourself and others. Uh, we can beat this together and let's stay together that way. And please, at any point in time, if you need anything, the RCD and the staff, uh, we're here to help. Uh, thank you very much and have a good weekend. And don't forget that if you did um, 